I'm Peter Codling, and I'm here today to talk about my revolutionary toilet design. We no longer think about the objects we use repetitively every day of our lives, and this stops us redesigning them. We use our brains less when we're using them. We go onto autopilot or we zone out. And this is explained in Charles Duhigg's The Power of Habit. He talks about experiments conducted on rats doing repetitive activities and measuring their brain activity. So the first time a little rat runs around the maze to find the chocolate bar, uh, his brain activity is huge because there's new sights, sounds, and smells. He's in a new environment. But as he repeats the task, he gets used to his environment. Um, he knows where he's going. He knows what he's going to find at the end of it. So his brain activity goes down. And we're the same. So when I'm brushing my teeth in the morning and I'm bending down to drink out of the tap, I'm not thinking how bad the ergonomics are, how bad the design of the sink is. I'm just going through the motions. And this creates an enormous untapped resource of design innovation. So I wondered which of these activities, which of these routines, are our most deeply rutted in our psyche. So I started to list the ones that we'd learned the earliest. I started to go through learning to walk, learning to talk, eating with a uh, knife and fork, tying our shoelaces. And are the objects we're using the best that they possibly could be, or are they just the things that we've always used? So I, I kept sort of going through my list. And then I came to the toilet. And the toilet, to me, is enormously interesting. Um, the more I've learned about it, the more I've read about it, it's a fascinating subject. And it's, it's, our attitudes to the toilet are ridiculous. We have this mixed bag of learning from parents and peers that has created this mystery and taboo around something that we all do every day of our lives. Everyone sitting in this room today has either gone this morning already or will be doing later this afternoon. So the toilet is, as I say, enormously interesting. And there's not much, apart from specialists, written about our attitudes to this, um, to this everyday phenomenon. There's entire theories of personality based around our toilet habits. Freud writes about how potty training influences our psyche and our mental health later in life. So when you're being potty trained by your parents, if you're rushed through the procedure and made to feel guilty and this area is dirty, then later in life it can lead to repression of sexual health and sexual feelings, which can be enormously detrimental to us long term. So I wondered, is there a better way? And the more I, as I was reading around and looking at different things, I, uh, I came across a work produced in the mid, uh, published in the mid-60s by Alexander Kira called The Bathroom. And in it, he looks at, it's the first truly bald, honest account I've found um, about everything that happens to us in the bathroom, mentally and physically. And he looks at everything from male and female urination angles to the difficulty men have trying to go to the toilet in an aroused, position, in an aroused state. Uh, so in it, he talks of something that has changed the work that I was doing enormously and has come up in many other places. And it's the most interesting thing that I find from looking at toilets is the fact that we evolved to defecate in a squatting position. So I wanted to find out more about this and understand the inner workings of our body and the various things that change between the two positions, standing and squatting. So I went to talk to Dr. Christine Norton, a professor of nursing and a specialist in the area, and she told me about the various things that are happening between us and our, in us, and, um, and I'll now tell you all about it. So first of all, as you move through the body, you have the colon. And in a standing position, your puborectalis muscle, which is pinned to your pelvis, shuts your colon tight. So it pulls it tight, creating two right angles in your colon that stop waste moving through your body. The next is your internal and external anal sphincter. So in a standing position, your internal sphincter, which you cannot control, is shut tight. 
And this is one of, this is, you have three barriers to, to basically stop you soiling yourself in public. You have your, your colon, as I've mentioned, the internal sphincter, which is tight in the standing position, and your external sphincter, which you can clench, is the muscle that you can clench. So in a squatting position, the puborectalis muscle is relaxed, and your anal sphincter is completely, is, is open, is relaxed and open, leaving a free flow of waste through the body. And the thing is, when you're in a standing position, all of, your, all of these muscles are tight and you're shut tight. In a squatting position, you're completely open. But in a sitting position, as we are on Western toilets, all of these barriers are only half closed. And these barriers lead to, in extreme circumstances, straining and fecal retention. Well, this is, what, this is the normal circumstance. Straining and fecal retention. And straining can lead to heart attacks in extreme circumstances, and fecal retention can contribute to colon cancer, but it has an effect on our day-to-day -day well-being and our long-term health. So I set myself this brief. I wanted to design a squat toilet for the Western market without the muscular difficulty and, or negative connotations. My, so I started with an exhaustive view at squatting. I wanted to examine every possible sit position that you could squat in. And from, I put lots of my friends in various squatting positions. And the key thing that I learned was that if you change someone's position very slightly, if you sit them back more slightly, you raise their feet up, or you open their legs at all, they have a really strong gut reaction that is, and it's a, a really strong negative reaction that is deep grained, deeply grained in our psyche. So I had to find a squatting position that would not only put you in the, at the, at the ergonomic angle that I needed for a squat, but would make you mentally comfortable with it. So I, I took this position and I iterated it, developed it, and understood how the various fatty parts of your body contacted it, how to, I had to avoid the back of the knee, which is a pain pressure point, how to make someone comfortable and avoid the coccyx and the various bits of bone. And I came away with a position that would fit my 5th and 95th percentile user, which is the vast majority of body shapes for men and women. Alongside this, I wanted to open up a dialogue with the people around me. I wanted to understand people's everyday routines in the bathroom and exactly what they were up to. So you put writing material on the back of a toilet door in the Royal College of Art and you get what you pay for. Um, but among the quite considered abuse, uh, there were some really interesting things that came through it. Exactly how many times people wipe, the sort of basics, how people lent with their arms, with their, their hands on their knees, exactly what their routine was, because everyone's is completely different. But it's something that we never discuss. We'll discuss our sexual habits or our sexual liaisons with our best friends, but you'll never talk about the quality of your last bathroom break. But also from this, I managed to find a few keen observers who were interested in the project. And this is something that I've had a great response to, and people were really interested in what I was going to do with it. So I had a few people who um, endeavored to help me further with the project. Little did they know. So I, my next step, step was to, I had my position, and I really wanted to understand it and prove that it worked. So I had to, had to build it. Build it and they will come. It was not what happened. But when you, when you say to a group of people, I have a new design concept, I have something that uh, you've never seen before, people are jumping over each other to come and try it out. But when you say to someone, I'd like you to go into that cubicle, disrobe, lower yourself into this plywood bear trap that I've made, do your business, and then come out and tell me all about it, people are slightly more reticent to join in. But I did get some key feedback that changed the look and feel of everything that I've done. So it, I needed, I realized I'd need handles to enable people to get into and out of the position. I'd understand the workflow much more 
how clothing worked in the situation, how you'd wipe yourself. I had to add handles, I had to scallop certain parts so that you could actually reach certain parts of your body. And it changed my project dramatically. So I came out with my final position. I had the ergonomic position that would fit all my body shapes. People could get in and out of it very easily. People understood which way around it was supposed to go, how you were supposed to sit on it. Um, but that left me with the much harder nut to crack, which was people's negative reaction mentally to squat toilets. And the more I talk about the project, the people's first reaction is to tell me about some awful squat toilet situation that happens to them at a, a truck stop in China or some awful <clears throat> long train ride they had in India. This is people who are used to Western toilets. And although these stories were quite funny at times, and I'd heard a lot of them, um, underneath it all there was a, a real negative attitude towards these things. People felt they were dirty and uncivilized. And I had to combat that in, my, in what I was designing. And it turned out that all I had to do was put a plinth underneath my toilet. So raising people's head height, changing the ride height of people on the toilet, literally raising people out of the gutter, completely changed people's um, mental view of what my toilet was. Just because uh, my biggest fear was that I would design this thing and people would look at it and be scared and not want to be part of and try my project that, I, that I'd spent so much time on. But this completely negated all of that feeling. That as well as adding s features that made it more like a real toilet. So it had a U-bend and it didn't look like you were looking down an endless black hole. Um, and this seemed to nullify uh, people's, people's problems. So constantly throughout the project, I was sketching and doing lots of fifth scale clay models and trying to understand how this thing would actually manifest itself. And it wasn't until I went to speak to Steve Bunn at the Royal College of Art Sculpture Department, he helped me understand that this would have a presence. It would be something, it would, ha it would have a physical f being in a room. It would have to be inviting. So I started to, scale, to um, sculpt these things out of one-to-one -one scale foam blocks. <clears throat> and after a few days of looking like I'd come in out of a snowstorm, I found my final, my final form that would marry both the ergonomics as well as be inviting to users. I wanted people to see it and want to sit in it. So I was very happy with this. It, took, it was a long time getting there. And here it is, the final, this is my toilet um, as I ex exhibited at the Royal College of Art Summer Exhibition last year. You can see my new boss, James Dyson, sitting in it, trying it out. Um, but this, the best validation that I could have wanted was people visiting the show and getting back to my plinth every day after doing a walk around and it being covered with footprints. And the fact that people, I couldn't stop people sitting in it. People were jumping in and out of it more than, and I was quite worried, because it's quite a delicate thing at the time. But, <clears throat> and further than that, the ultimate validation for me was when I was showing my family around, and I, was tur I turned around to talk to a tutor, and uh, meanwhile, uh, my 88-year-old grandmother had swung herself out of her wheelchair and plonked herself in the toilet and just sat there grinning at me, which is was, which was fantastic. And to have someone of that age not only trust it as something they'd never seen before, but want to interact with it and so it actually be as inviting as I wanted it to be, just it felt great to see her sitting there. Unfortunately, I don't have it with me today, so you can't try it out yourselves. Um, it's actually part of a bid along with Toronto University, a waterless version of this toilet, um, in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Waterless Toilet Challenge, which is soon to be judged in New Delhi. But I am looking for someone to help me, partner with me, and make my vision a reality. I think having toilets like this that not only create a beautiful visual, but enable people to go to the toilet more, uh, more quickly, more efficiently, and more comfortably 
is my ultimate dream. And I do hope that one day these will be in, in people's homes and affecting as many people as possible. So my dream is to have a toilet that allows people's bodies to rid themselves of waste in the manner with which they were designed. And I do hope one day that is a reality. So I hope you've enjoyed my talk. Um, thank you very much. And I hope, one, I hope now, more than ever, you really know your shit.